And so now it is really my pleasure uh, to talk about um, a 35 year resident of Chappaqua. And when I told her, oh, I forgot to bring my um, introduction about you. She said, don't worry, just look it up on Google and you'll find everything you need to know. So without further ado, please welcome Nora Guthrie. Or you can catch me at the Chappaqua Village Market. And <laughs> Randy, Randy knows all about me there, for those of you who know Randy. So hi, everybody. It's actually, it's so much fun looking at some of your chat notes. I'm a little distracted. <laughs> so many of you are sending such nice stories. But um, I'm going to move it along and um, talk about this new book that just came out that I worked on. It's called Woody Guthrie's Songs and Art, Words and Wisdom because Woody did all of these things. He wrote songs. He actually wrote about 3000 songs, but he also was an artist and he also was a wordsmith and a letter writer and an essay writer and a novelist. And he was pretty smart too. I consider this personally a book of more philosophical than anything else actually. Um, because when I first started working on it, I, I had this line in my head that Bob Dylan had said, and he said, you could listen to Woody's songs and learn how to live. And I thought that was such an interesting comment. Boy, that was really perceptive because I looked at myself and I said, so you learned how to live. This is how I learned how to live. And I thought it's kind of bigger than my my personal uh, Bible in a sense, like a family Bible here. And I think that it's something that everyone can relate to in a lot of ways in a time when we're so divisive and everyone has a, has a, a particular tent that they're under. There are bigger ideas that we all share and bigger feelings that we all share. And that's what I really tried to get across in this book. I'm going to just show you the table of contents here, which will give you an idea of what's in the book. The first chapter is a self-portrait. Basically, it's Woody, in his own words, talking about himself. We've all heard other people talking about Woody and writing about Woody, but we very rarely get to hear his point of view about who he is. So I wanted to share uh, some information about that. The second chapter is about the places I've been. We traveled around the country from California to the New York Island and every state in between. And he wrote some really interesting pieces of work, did some interesting artwork, et cetera. So we cover some of the geography of the country as well. The third chapter is how to write songs. And I thought it's actually very interesting to see how he writes songs. We'll get to that as part of this uh, program tonight. Chapter four is things that are right and things that are wrong. And that's a direct quote from uh, one of his writings. And I love the fact that it's that simple. There are things that are right and things that are wrong. And sometimes we really complicate things, overthink things. And every child knows things that are right and things that are wrong. So I'm going to be sharing a piece of that with you too. Hello, people is chapter five. Woody loved people. He wrote lots and lots of songs about people. He met a lot of people. He was literally the fly on the wall around the country watching and listening to what the people said. So we have that information too. Chapter six is about love, which a lot of people don't realize how important love was to him. He wrote a lot of songs about love. He wrote a lot of notes in his diaries about love. Well, We'll be showing you some of that as well. All Work Together, chapter seven is about family life. Uh, him as a father, us as children, his love for children and his belief in children. Chapter eight is about his religion, one man religion. So I'm gonna show you one or two ideas about what he has to say about our spiritual life. Also, I'll just quickly mention that in each of the chapters I invited a contemporary, someone who I think really reflects the same philosophy that's in the chapters as he did. So each chapter is um, introduced by a contemporary person. 
How to Write Songs is introduced by Roseanne Cash. Things That Are Right and Things That Are Wrong is introduced by Chuck D from Public Enemy. Chapter five is introduced by Jeff Daniels, the actor about people. Chapter six about love is introduced by Ani DeFranco. One Man Religion is introduced by my brother, Arlo Guthrie. I think I've covered all of that. So there's a lot in here. Like I say, it's a collage. It's a collection of writings, learning how to live. That's what Woody was all about. We opened the book with one of my favorite little quotes of his, all of my words, if not well put nor well taken, are well meant. The self-portrait is really interesting. You see the scribbles there on the page. These are all taken from the bottoms of letters, of songs, of texts that he wrote. He always annotated his songs. He annotated his letters, basically annotated everything. And you, you might be familiar with some of these. You'll see up on the top there, take it easy, but take it. That was found uh, at the bottom of a piece of writing. Uh, I, I like some of the ones that he says, you know, what do you think? Give me a call, drop a line. Me and my harp and guitar are hot and ready. That was on one of the letters. I love the one he writes. I always like this one better than the people that heard it, which is very interesting. That was at the bottom of one of his songs. So it gives you an idea and self-portrait about the various um, qualities that he had, his humor, his seriousness in the army, as a fighter, as a comedian, as a singer, as a lover. It's all there in his signatures. One of my favorite quotes that I put in the book is this one, I am a changer, a constant changer. I have to be or die because whatever stops changing is dead and I am alive. When Woody was a little boy, he grew up in Okima, Oklahoma. And he wrote this song about growing up as a little fighter. I thought this was so interesting. When I was a little boy, first I had to grow, then I had to guess, and then I had to know. First I played marbles and then I played ball, but I had to study fighting most of all, most of all. I had to study fighting most of all. When I was a little boy, next I had to see, then I had to feel, I even tried to steal. I learned how to eat, I had learned how to work, but I had to study fighting most of all, most of all. I had to study fighting most of all. When I was a little boy, I had to get bigger. I had to get wider, I had to get longer. I had to throw some rocks and I had to learn to run, but I had to study fighting most of all, most of all. And I thought this uh, early, influence what it was like where he was growing up, where you really learned to be a fighter. And it's something that he kept with him all his life, that ability to be in a good fight. By the way, the artwork that you'll see throughout here is his illustrations and drawings. This particular one is from his autobiography, Bound for Glory. Another thing that really um, helps you understand his feelings. This is a portrait of him with his mother. His mother had Huntington's disease, which he eventually inherited. And as she was falling apart, he was trying to help. And you can see him trying to hold his mother up in this picture. But I think it was really interesting because these are the early influences. He learned how to fight. He learned about empathy and caring for people who were not well. When he finally got to writing songs, he went to California and he landed a radio show in California. It was just a 15 minute spot, but it was very, very popular because it was popular with the Okies and the Arkies and the Texies and all the people that had migrated from the great dust storm. One of my favorite little quips of his is up there. It's called stage light. Don't swap this raw sunshine for too much stage light. The fight is here, lots more than on the stage. We also included some of the portraits of him. Who was his audience? This was his audience, the farm workers community, the Dust Bowl refugees, 
the farmers uh, that were homeless at the time. So I thought this was really interesting in this day and age when we think of performers and singer songwriters, you know, we think of like cool venues where people sing and clubs and things like that. That was not Woody's audience. Woody's audience was pretty much on the road and wherever the people gathered on the road, that's where he would perform. This is from that same place. You could see this very slick advertising here, Woody and his guitar singing his own song, Songs of the Common People, dedicated to Skid Row and Dust Bowl refugees. And again, this is a artwork from his book, Bound for Glory. I wanna say that when Woody got an idea in his head, he used every single opportunity and every part of himself to express how he felt. So in the book, we have photographs, we have his artwork, so when he was talking about the Dust Bowl, there's artwork about the Dust Bowl, there's songs about the Dust Bowl, there's letters about the Dust Bowl, there's essays about the Dust Bowl, and every single topic that we cover in those six chapters that I showed you is really a collage of all of these ways he had of expressing himself. So it's a very, very visual book. There is one piece of writing that I actually would love to read out loud to you, uh, particularly for a New York audience because we love our delicatessens, right? Um, this is a piece where he writes how he's discovering who he is as a songwriter, who he is as a performer. And it's called Voice. I'll read it to you so you can just sit back and have a nice listen. He writes, I don't know how far I'm going to have to go to see my own self or hear my own voice. I tuned into the radio and for hours I never heard it. And then I went to the moving pictures shown, never heard it there. I put handful of coins into machines and watched records turn, but the voice there was no voice of mine. I mean, it was not my voice. The words, not words that I hear in my own ears when I walk along and look at your faces. I sat here in a Jewish delicatessen. I order a hot pastrami sandwich on rye and I hear the lady ask me, would you like to have a portion of coleslaw on the side? And I knew when I heard her speak that she spoke my voice. And I told her I would take my coleslaw on a side dish. and would like to have a glass of tea with lemon. And she knew that I was speaking her words. And a fellow sat across at a table near my wall and he spoke while he ate his salami and drank his beer. And somehow I had the feeling as I heard him speak and he spoke a long time, but not one word was in my personal language. And I could tell by the deep sound, by the full tone of his voice, that he spoke my language. I suppose you may wonder just how he could speak his language in a dialogue, dialect that I could not savvy or understand, and yet understand every sound that he made. I learned to do this a long time ago, walking up and down the side roads in the main stems of this land here. I learned to listen this way when I washed dishes on the ships. I had to learn how to do it when I walked ashore in Africa and in Scotland and in Ireland and in Britain, London, Liverpool, Glasgow, Scots towns and Anglo farms, Irish canals and railroad bridges, Highlanders, cows and horses. And here I knew the speech was the same as mine, but it was the dialect again, nasal, roady, deep chesty from the stomach, lungs high in the head, pitched up and down. And here I had to learn again to say, this is my language and part of my voice. Oh, but I have not even heard this voice, these voices on the stages, screens, radios, records, jukeboxes, in magazines, nor not in newspapers, seldom in courtrooms and more seldom when students and policemen study the faces behind the voices. And I thought as I saw a drunken street walking man mutter and spit and curse into the wind out of the cafe's plate glass, that maybe if I looked close enough, I might hear some more of my voice. And I ate as quiet as I could so as to keep my eyes and my ears and my feelings wide open and did hear. I heard all that I came to hear in Coney Island's Jewish air. I heard reflections, recollections, seen faces and memory, 
heard voices untangle their words before me. And I knew by the feeling I felt that here was my voice. <laughs> she liked that. <laughs> uh, we're going to go over to chapter two again, just to give you a little idea of his feelings and thoughts about the country. I'm going to just read one or two lines, uh, paragraphs from this little piece. It's called, This is Our Country Here. It's written in 1946, you'll see. He writes, this is our country here as far as you can see, no matter which way you walk or no matter what spot of it you stand on. When you've crossed her as many times as I have, you will see as many ugly things about her as pretty things. You will hear whole gangs of travelers and settlers arguing about her, what she is, how she come to be, what you are supposed to do here. And you will hear some argue at you that she's so beautiful, you're supposed to just spend your life feeling of her pretty parts, sucking in her sweetest breezes and tasting her fairest odors, looking at her brightest colored scenes. I would say that gang has the wrong notion. And there are some bunches that tell you she's all ugly and all dirty and that there's nothing good about her, nothing free, nothing clean, that she is all slums, shacks, rot, filth, stink, and bad odors, loud words of bitter flavors. Well, this herd is big and I heard them often and I heard them loud, but I come to think that they too were just as wrong as the first outfit because I seen the pretty and I seen the ugly. And it was because I knew the pretty part that I wanted to change the ugly part because I hated the dirty part, but I knew how to feel the love for the cleaner part. Um, Woody represented many situations where people were homeless, migrants, like we talked about, Okies, disenfranchised, people that had lost their farms after having them for generations, et cetera. And he wrote a lot of songs, especially in the Dust Bowl um, albums. This one is called I Ain't Got No Home in the World Anymore. And um, the artwork, again, is from Bound for Glory, where he's sleeping on the road, dreaming of people that he knew back home. I included uh, in this presentation tonight, we, of course, we have a lot more. The book is like 350 something pages long. We're going to look at 50 of those pages tonight about um, one of the places he spent some time was California. Some of you might know the song Do Re Mi that's up on the screen there, if you ain't got the Do Re Mi. And he talks about how hard it was for the uh, people migrating to California during the Dust Bowl to cross the California border. You had to prove that you had X amount of money on you so that you weren't considered a vagrant to cross the border. And they had police cars uh, and vigilante groups stopping a lot of these people from getting into California. So that's the song original typed Do Re Mi. You can see on the bottom of it, for those of you who are interested, I, we talked about the anecdotes that he wrote on all of his lyrics. So there's a complete explanation. This song was written in 1938 and he'll write at the bottom more information about why he wrote the song and what he saw when he tried to cross the California border. On the other side, we have the lyric California Stars. And I had to include that because the band Wilco uh, recorded that. We did an album called Mermaid Avenue with Billy Bragg and Wilco probably about 20 years ago. Oh my God, I had blonde hair then. Um, no, um, but <laughs> California Stars, that's the original lyric for those of you who enjoyed the Mermaid Avenue albums that we did. He also spent a lot of time up in the Pacific Northwest. He did a projects for the Bonneville Dam, a building of the Bonneville Dam. And one of his most beautiful songs is Pastures of Plenty. We included that beautiful lyric in the book with this beautiful photograph of him as well. So that's representing you people up there in the great Pacific Northwest. Woody always said a song should be as long as the story you're trying to tell. He wrote some very long lyrics. 
There are a few of them in the book. Some of them take up two or three pages. They're that long, like 80 verses. But this is one of the shortest ones he ever wrote and probably not one of the best ones he ever wrote either. It's called I'm Shipping Up to Boston. But I had to include it because a punk band up in Boston recorded it, Dropkick Murphys. And it was such a great tune that they put to it. Martin Scorsese heard it, loved it, and made it like the theme song of his movie, The Departed. And the same year for you baseball fans, the uh, Boston Red Sox won the, uh, you know, what do they call it? <laughs> the World Series. You can see how much I know about baseball. So the Boston Red Sox used this song uh, when they won the, that last uh, game, when the pitcher went out and did the jig to I'm shipping up to Boston with the Dropkick Murphys playing it. So it just goes to show you, you know, going from a lyric like Pastures of Plenty, which is so moving and, and so uh, profound in a way, to a song like Shipping Up to Boston. You know, he wrote from all kinds of topics, but congratulations to Shipping Up to Boston and Dropkick Murphys. <laughs> Woody did also come to New York in 1940. I love this photograph of him. This is in Bryant Park, actually. And I love what he wrote in one of his diaries. He wrote, there is one and only one New York. And if you don't see it, you're doing yourself and your country an injustice. It's got the best of the least for the most and the most of the best for the least. 1947, that's C-I-N-Y-C stands for Coney Island, New York City, which is where we're, we landed as a family. I love the fact that he traveled the subways. He wrote talking subway blues in New York City, which is very, very funny. This oaky, basically hillbilly kind of guy coming to New York for the first time and expressing uh, lots of things about how he felt about subways and crowds and high fashion and things like that. We've included a lot of those impressions in the book. And you can see here um, on the side, the big portrait of his face was taken from one of those 25 cent you know, you get four four portraits for 25 cents down in the subways. I loved it. I thought it was one of the best pictures I ever saw of him. And the rest is uh, him busking in the subway. And he's on the Chambers Street IRT there, going out to Coney Island, I guess. Correct me if I'm wrong. I know someone's going to correct me and say, the IRT didn't go to Coney Island. I forget what it was. It was Chambers Street. It went to the A train, the D A train. Thank you. So... Woody, uh, some of you might know that Dylan also did a talking subway kind of talking New York blues, very much based on this. He used this talking subway blues as a template for a number of his songs as well. When he came to New York, he actually wrote, this land is your land on 43rd Street and 6th Avenue. I grew up thinking, he must have written it in Oklahoma, Texas, California, someplace like that. But hey, guys, it was written in a flop house on 43rd Street and 6th Avenue, an old uh, flop house called Hanover House, where he stayed for a couple of weeks when he first arrived in New York. That made me realize that this song is much more interesting, actually, than just the school version that we, that we learned, because it's basically a journal of his travels across the country. So when he writes, as I went walking that ribbon of highway, he did walk that ribbon of highway and he saw above him endless skyways and he saw below himself golden valleys. And then he said, this land was made for you and me. He also saw big high walls there that tried to stop me. A sign was painted, it said private property, but on the back side, it didn't say nothing. That side was made for you and me. When the sun comes shining and I was strolling, the wheat fields were waving dust clouds rolling, the voice was chanting as the fog was lifting, this land was made for you and me. So it's, I think it's a much uh, more interesting song than, than we might have suspected. And you can see again, thank you, Woody, he writes at the bottom, February 23rd, 1940, 43rd Street and 6th Avenue, Hanover House. He also writes at the bottom of this lyric, all you can write is what you see, which is really a his, his motto, uh, everything that's in this lyric is something that he experienced, something he saw. It's not fantasy, it's not imagination. And you can look through all of his work, 
in all of this book, and you, you'll find that to be the case. I had to point out another lyric that he wrote when we lived in Brooklyn. Uh, we lived in Coney Island on Mermaid Avenue for a while, and then we moved over to Beach Haven, an apartment complex in Brighton Beach on Ocean Avenue there. Those Brooklyn people, I can see people are going to be writing like, I lived on Ocean Avenue. <laughs> so uh, Beach, Beach Haven ain't my home. Now he wrote this when he realized that they were turning away Black families from getting apartments. So wouldn't you know, the Beach Haven complex was run by the Trump Organization. And Woody wrote a number of songs, letters, notes, diary entries about the situation there. I included this one lyric because he actually calls out the family. Beach Haven ain't my home, I'm just drifting through. My wife and angel kids are trapped inside these walls where I can't plow or plant nor hang out my family's clothes. Old man Trump, old Beach Haven ain't my home. Beach Haven ain't my home, I just can't pay this rent. My money's down the drain and my soul is badly bent. Beach Haven looks like heaven where no black ones come to roam. No, 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 old man Trump. Old Beach Haven ain't my home. Across Beach Haven's grass, I see my brethren's pass. They try to hide their misery behind the window glass. We all are crazy fools as long as race hate rules. No, 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 old man Trump. Beach Haven ain't my home. 1952. We go to chapter three. I'll just give you one or two ideas of what's in this one. He writes his thoughts about folk music. I found this in a little, little diary entry. A folk song is what's wrong and how to fix it. Or it could be who's hungry, where their mouth is. Or it's who's out of work and where the job is. Or who's broken where the money is. Or who's carrying a gun and where the peace is. The notebook says you can see at the top how to write songs. And on the other side, you'll see all the little notes, musical notes, getting all together on the side of the page. He says, we've got to get organized. Um, one of the techniques that he used for songwriting, which might be valuable to anyone who writes anything actually, is this idea of putting down titles. Would he put song titles, lists of song titles in books? And then he would go back, could be six months later or a year or something, go back and suddenly the lyric uh, would come to him the title would inspire a song. So he writes, just the idea of the title for your song is more than half of the battle to catch your ballad. I've got thousands of titles laid away like postal savings bonds. I spend hours and hours just writing down my ideas for titles to my songs. And some of the titles are very, very funny. He kind of goes on a, a trip, you know, mental trip single girl blues, two hungry babies, starving, starving family blues, leaky root blues, no money blues, the drunken father, the frozen orphan, the drunken mother, which I was single again, holy stocking blues, no rent blues, no job blues, parents lament, crowded room blues, GI loan blues, hock shop rag, pawn shop poker. <laughs> this cracked me up. Bucket shop waltz, trifling husband, trifling wife. Trifling sweetie, jealous father, jealous mother, daggery knife, oily gun rag, et cetera, et cetera. I insisted on putting three pages in the book of all of these titles, which are just great to read. Some of the songs that he wrote were based on newspaper uh, events or newspaper articles and important historic events. This one was written about 1913 massacre, which was the copper miners strike. And uh, you can see from the newspaper article, the party that the miners were having for Christmas was uh, uh, stopped by some, some of the uh, copper miner owners uh, scabs and uh, 74 children died in that, in su getting suffocated. Um, it's a very serious and very, very beautiful uh, lyric. He includes all the information of exactly what happened. 
If by any chance any of you are interested, we have an exhibit right now at the Morgan Library in New York City, a Woody Guthrie exhibit, it's very beautiful. And we've been doing a lot of programming there. And we're actually gonna be showing the documentary 1913 Massacre at the Morgan Library. Uh, it was based on two young filmmakers who heard the song and wanted to find out what really happened. So we'll be showing that film with the filmmakers on May 12th at the Morgan Library. I also found a, a piece of writing that he wrote for WNEW. You guys remember WNEW, <laughs> New York City Radio? I remember it. Oh my God. Um, and I love this also has become a mo uh, such an important statement from him about who he is and what he believes in. And he writes, I, I hate a song that makes you think you're not any good. I hate a song that makes you think you're just born to lose, bound to lose, no good to nobody, no good for nothing, because you're either too old or too young or too fat or too slim or too ugly or too this or too that. Songs that run you down or songs that poke fun of you on account of your bad luck or your hard traveling. Well, I am out to fight those kind of songs to my very last breath of air and my last drop of, of blood. I'm out to sing songs that will prove to you that this is your world and that if it has hit you pretty hard and knocked you for a dozen loops, no matter how hard you, you're down or rolled over, no matter what color you are, how you're built, I am out to sing the songs that make you take pride in yourself and in your work. And the songs that I sing are made up for the most part for folks just about like you. So many of these things that I'm reading out of the book, I picked because they're just so prescient to the world that we live in now, uh, whether it's gender identity, um, all these things that are going on in the world and in America right now, whether it's race hate, identity, who I am. People think I'm you know, too small, too this, too that. Um, I, I felt like in a way, that's why I call the book in a way our family Bible, because there were so many ideas that really transcend someone's personal life. He was able to expand these ideas so that I feel like anyone can open up a page in this book and find something that touches them and inspires them and makes them feel good. He writes on the other side of the page, there's several ways of saying what's on your mind. And in states and counties where they ain't too healthy to talk out loud, speak your mind or even to vote like you want to, folks have found other ways of getting the word around. One of the mainest ways is by singing. Drop the word folk and just call it real old, honest to God, America singing. Good idea. Well, one of the uh, things that Woody wrote about and sang about quite a lot was fascism. Some of you might be familiar with this photograph. It's kind of become his iconic photograph where he wrote on his guitar, this machine kills fascists. And he wrote in his diary, my big Gibson guitar has got a sign I painted on it, it says this machine kills fascists. And it means just what it says too. This wonderful song, You Fascist Bound to Lose. Also, I was able to record with Billy Bragg, for those of you who might know his work and Wilco. Very important lyric that I'm finding a young people are singing these days. He wrote, music is just a handy way of telling what's on your mind. No mind, no music. I also wanted to share just one cartoon series that's in the book. He was a great cartoonist. And this is a series that's very apropos again to what's happening in the world right now. This is a day. This is a dollar. This is the hand. This is the boss. Punch in the clock. Boss watches hand work till sundown. Hand gives boss a loaf of bread. Boss pays hand. Hand buys loaf of bread. Hand kids eat bread. 
cries for more. Hand balls wife out. Wife balls hand out. Hand thinks it over. Hand cusses boss out. Boss yells cops. Law and order comes. Hand is charged with trying to overthrow the US government. Join the CIO. Uh, there's a wonderful picture. Woody did a lot of his performing on union lines and supporting unions, et cetera. And one of the, his earliest uh, protégés was a little guy named Pete Seeger there on the banjo you'll see. That's Woody, he's about 27 years old and Pete, he's about 19 years old when they first met. By the way, um, Woody wrote This Land is Your Land uh, when he was 27 years old. It was kind of amazing, right? It's, it's not the song that is the culmination of all his writing. It's actually one of his earliest songs. And again, going with Pete around to the union uh, boycotts and strikes, et cetera, this is a note from the Westinghouse strike and made up and sung for the Pittsburgh strikers. And of course, there's the very well-known song, Union Made. There once was a union made, she never was afraid of the goons and the ginks and the company finks and the deputy sheriff that made the raid. She went to the union hall when a meeting it was called. And when the company boys come round, she always stood her ground. You can't scare me, I'm sticking to the union. One of the lyrics that I found and wanted to include in the book is called, Whereabouts Can I Hide? And it, it's three verses and each verse covers something that's crucially important right now. Justice, oh justice, whereabouts can I hide? Liberty is locked up by the fascists tonight. Freedom got sold for her carcass and bones. Justice, oh justice, whereabouts can I hide? Freedom, oh freedom, where do you hide? I look through my wrecked street, but you, I can't see the last word. Peace got beat up by the stormtroopers last night. Freedom, oh freedom, where do you hide? Democracy, democracy, hey, lift up your head. This is the same curbstone where my family bled. The voters are voting whilst blood soaks it red. Democracy, democracy, hey. Lift up your head. Some of the cartoons he did for voter registration, guys getting kicked out of the house. Don't you come back until you register to vote. And even the uh, prostitutes up there in the corner are saying, how dare you enter my door without registering to vote? Hmm. Everybody's in on it. He writes, I don't care how good your good old days was for you. They're not good enough for me. Uh, in the people section, I'm just going to show you a few of the lyrics that he wrote. I mentioned before how long some of the ballads can be. Of course, the one on one side is Harriet Tubman, the ballad of Harriet Tubman, who had such a long, interesting life that he put it all down there, Harriet Tubman. And the other one is Isaac Woodard, um, another long song, a very important uh, ballad that he wrote. And on the lighter side, he also wrote about Joe DiMaggio, baseball guy, right? Joe DiMaggio done it again. And he wrote about Ingrid Bergman. He says, Ingrid Bergman, let's us go make a picture on the island of Stromboli. He had a little bit of a crush on her. He also wrote about FDR, Dear Mrs. Roosevelt. This song was actually recorded by Dylan with the band in 1968 at a concert that we did at Carnegie Hall. Uh, Bob had just come out of recuperating from his motorcycle accident and uh, did this song, beautiful version of it of, uh, with the band. Before it was the band, it was just the band, Bob and the band, and then it became the band. And one of the other songs that he wrote was Ilse Koch, which was the story of a Nazi woman who, worked, uh, who uh, was, was in Buchenwald. And he, this is his cutout of the article. I talked a little bit about where he got some of his ideas. And a lot of this is history talking. Woody came from a Scots-Irish background. His mother used to sing these long Scotch-Irish ballads to him in the troubadour uh, sense. 
And so many of his songs really fall into that category as troubadour telling people what's going on in the world. And this particular song was about a Nazi in Buchenwald. And he talks about it in the first person. He writes, I'm here in Buchenwald, my numbers on my skin. Old Ilse Koch is here. The prisoners walk the grounds. The hounds have killed a girl. The guards have shot a man. Some more have starved to death. Here comes the prisoner's car. They dump them in the pen, etc. cetera. Um, I did record this one with the Klezmatics a number of years ago. Uh, you can find it on their album. I thought it was one of the first songs I've done a little bit of research on that was ever written about a concentration camp. It was written in 1948. So it's kind of interesting history there too. He also wrote about people that had no names. One of his most popular songs was Deportee. Otherwise it was called the Los Gatos plane wreck. And this was also from a newspaper article where there was a plane wreck and the people's names of the pilot and the stewardess uh, were named in the article, but not the deportees who were being, or migrant workers that were being sent back to Mexico. And one of the things that we found has happened a lot with Woody's material is that he leaves some stories untold with just a hint of what's happening. A few years ago, a young scholar got really interested in the story that he heard through the song. And he researched what really happened. And lo and behold, he found the names of every single person the Mexicans that were being deported, contacted their families and got them together and did a mass, um, a mass memorial service. This would happened in California and put all of their names, now that we know them, on the uh, memorial plaque there in California. Brought all of the families there. And I love the fact that Woody has inspired young people to continue telling the stories, to continue finding out what happened, what's happening in the world. Uh, just to give you an idea, uh, you'll see on one side of the page, this is a partial list of some of the people Woody wrote about in his songs and his stories. And on the other side, you'll see is a portrait of Lincoln. Woody started out actually as a visual artist, did a lot of oil paintings in his early life. This is from 1937. But he found that songwriting was also a way of painting portraits of people and telling stories. And that's the route he decided to take. One other thing that took place in New York was he met my mom. <laughs> I have to say that, right? So he's like, my New York City is the place where I met you. And that's a picture of my mom, Marjorie. And she was a dancer with the Martha Graham Company, actually, at the time. That's her. 1940. And again, here's Woody's interpretation, an artist of the Graham technique, actually. So in our house was not just musicians. I mean, you might think of that it would be just, uh, it was Sonny Terry, Brownie McGee, Lead Belly, people like that in the folk scene. But there was also Martha Graham and Eric Hawkins and uh, Merce Cunningham. My mother was Merce's teacher, actually, and Eric's teacher as well. So it was a really interesting uh, party at my house. <laughs> modern dance, Woody and modern dance. So I just wanted to read this one last thing that I'll read to you. Speaking of dance, uh, he became very interested in dance and he wrote this beautiful piece that I think is kind of an ode to all women, which is again, very appropriate today. I say to you, woman and man, I'll say to you, woman, come out from your home and be the wild dancer of my breed. I'll say to my man, come out from your walls and move in your space as free and as wild as my woman. I'm married and wed to a dancer in my front line. And the way she moves and beats my, and while I beat my skin drum would knock your soul and your lights out. I beat my old drum skin and sing to my big family. You, Arlo, you, Stacky, you, Teeny, you, Stewball, you, Bill, you, Marjorie. Those are the names of the kids. Come out from your maid walls and out from your sins and out from your sick spell and dance to high glory. 
you poor sick head poet that sung to my woman to stay here in these sod walls and lays around sleepy and doze around sheepy while your man is the one to go out and see the action. You jail home poets are dead in my dust. I sing your song, but I sing it just backwards. I say to my woman, dance out of your home, dance out and see fighting, dance out and see people, dance out to run factories, dance out to see street meets, dance out in the deep stream, dance out to your vote box, dance down to your office, dance over to your counter, dance up your big stairs. And if your husband gets jealous, dance out to new lovers. If your man keeps your heart tied, dance out and untie it. Dance out to sing equal, dance out and be pretty, dance around and be free. And if I just had this one thing to say to a husband, it would be these words, go dance. That's all, just jump up and let go and dance. Dance in your own way, sing your own song, whoop in your own kind of a yell in the start and in the finish of your dance. Mammy of nature gave birth to you in her body and hills. You give birth now to old female mommy nature in the male feelings and rivers. Go dance, both of you, go dance. Family chapter, he wrote down everything that we said and he turned it into a song. For those of you who have kids that can't stop asking why, he wrote why oh why oh why oh and he covers all the bases why can't a bird eat an elephant why can't a dish break a hammer why can't a mouse seize a streetcar etc cetera, etc cetera. so his love of children is really evident in so many of the songs he sings and this is an example of the child my sister kathy her own words for it where he got all of his inspiration to write children's songs Here's just a couple of nice photos that we have of him on the beach. This is in Coney Island, Beach 36th Street, if you know your Coney Island. Uh, he was the master of sandcastle building in our neighborhood and taught us all to build sandcastles. He wrote so many wonderful children's songs. This is a manuscript that we found that each page of each of these songs is illustrated and painted by him. And what he did was he would write from the morning, wake up songs till the very end of the day, sleep eye songs. It was a wonderful way of manipulating your children. I highly recommend it. Don't tell your children what to do. Write a song about what you want them to do and have them act it out. He believed in children, new multitudes. Give me new multitudes. Gonna lose this generation, gotta have new multitudes. Got to win my battle for peace with new multitudes. Going to build up my old world over. You got to have new multitudes. This is a typical book entry that he had where he would uh, have a song lyric, artwork, etc. Just multi, <laughs> a beautiful collage, right? I just love the look of it. And I love the simplicity of the message. Uh, I have to put this one in because my grandmother was a Yiddish poet and she wrote a lot of songs in Yiddish. And my father illustrated a lot of her songs. I did an album with the Klesmatics a couple of years ago, actually two albums based on Jewish themed songs that Woody wrote and the Klesmatics set to music. And you'll see on the left, there are some of the, um, the light that burned, that's the Hanukkah candle, the Shabbos candles are there and the grandpa with the payas telling the children's stories. And one of the really, really, really funny songs that I came across was Nash Oh Nash, because I mean, who else could write G-O-G, -G, gosh, oh gosh, I'm gonna nosh my humantash. Masterful, masterful lyric, don't you think? <laughs> In terms of religion, my father said, I got me sort of a one man religion. My religion is so big. No matter who you are, you're in it. And no matter what you do, you can't get out of it. Words of peace, arts of peace. Again, just a beautiful example of how he decorated his lyrics and his ideas. 
one of the last things that we're going to have in this program is a lyric that I recorded also with Jeff Tweedy and Billy Bragg. And um, in it, I think it's so beautiful. He writes, sometimes I think I'm going to lose my mind, but I don't, I'm sorry. Sometimes I think I'm going to lose my mind, but it don't look like I ever do. I loved so many people everywhere I went, some too much and others not enough. I don't know, I may go down or up or anywhere, but I feel like this scribbling will stay. Maybe if I hadn't have seen so much hard feelings, I might not, I could have felt other people's. So when you think of me, if and when you do, just say, well, another man's done gone. And I took that line, I feel like this scribbling will stay has kind of become my job to find ways of making sure that these scribblings that we've been through here tonight stick around. As Bob said, you could listen to his songs and actually learn how to live. And he even wrote a list of how to live just in case you need particular directions. One, work more and better. Two, work by a schedule. Three, wash teeth if any. Four, shave. Five, Take a bath. Six, eat good fruit, vegetables, milk. Seven, drink very scant, if any. Eight, write a song a day. Nine, wear clean clothes, look good. 10, shine your shoes. 11, change socks. 12, change bed clothes often. 13, read lots of good books. 14, listen to the radio a lot. 15, learn people better. 16, keep Rancho clean. 17, don't get lonesome. 18, stay glad. 19, keep hoping machine running. 20, dream good. 21, bank all extra money. 22, save dough. 23, have company, but don't waste time. 24, send Mary and the kids money. 25, play and sing good. 26, dance better. 27, help win war, beat fascism. 28, love mama. 29, love Papa. 30, love Pete. 31, love everyone. 32, make up your mind. 33, wake up and fight. That's my program. I will also mention that the book is available um, at Scattered Books in Chappaqua and down at the Village Bookstore in Pleasantville signed copies. So I guess we're going right. to do some talking right. and I, questions. This was wonderful, especially when you talked about Brooklyn. I'm a Brooklyn girl. So Yay. I loved every second about Ocean Avenue. So thank yeah. you. <laughs> um, <gasps> right. So as you um, all, we have so many people here that it's amazing. Um, and I know a lot of you want to ask questions. So if you would please write it in the chat function. Uh, the other screen that you see is Anna. Anna is uh, Nora's daughter. So hi, Anna. Hi, everyone. Um, I know uh, we're already getting how inspiring and how excellent it was and what a great program. And that's just exactly how all of us feel. So if you have any questions rather than comments, if you would put it in the chat function, Anna's going to monitor that. All of Anna's friends are writing in. She's very popular in Chappaqua. Because <laughs> she has kids in the school now here. So, you know, everybody the Guthrie knows family that. is here in Chappaqua. Well, funnily enough, we actually, Marjorie, Nora's mom, was at Bell School in the very early 1980s and did a program on Woody Guthrie and did a program about Huntington's disease. I found out on one of the Chappaqua Facebook pages. So this is three generations, four generations of Guthrie in this town. Nora, we have one question here. It says, if it's not too personal, could you tell us a bit about what Woody was like as a dad? Yeah. Um, I just want to go back. There was another question about the music. I just want to tell if anybody, um, if anybody wants to, if you go to woodyguthrie.org, we actually have a store where as you go through the book, everything that's in the book pretty much has been recorded. And if you go on our store, you can, you, you know, you can find the song 
or the albums, et cetera. We talked about the Klezmatics doing the German, uh, Jewish material, both of those albums we have, et cetera. And then of course, Woody's Dust Bowl Ballads and things like that. So because there are no more CD stores, you know, there's no music stores. So we've kind of taken on that role. Uh, you can find all the music at woodyguthrie.org as well as all the books, et cetera. So you wanted to know about my dad as a father? A lot of it, again, is in the book. Um, to be honest, my father got Huntington's disease when I was quite young. And I lived knowing him as a very sick man until I was 17, until he passed away. Uh, I was mostly, as everyone in our family was, a caretaker for him. And uh, it's a, it was a very difficult disease. I wasn't really able to... Um, get intimate in that in the way that this book is very intimate it wasn't until after when i got older that i really formed a, a much more profound relationship because of his material uh, he was a fun father on the beach you can tell he played when you when you look at his songs like i said if he wanted us to do something he never told us to do something he'd write a song so he wrote pick it up I drop my shoe, pick it up, pick it up, I drop my shoe. Let's act it out. Oh, pick it up, pick it up. <laughs> uh, Clino, uh, I'm going to take a bath. I'm going to brush my teeth. Clino, Clino, let's go Clino. Oh, okay, we're going to take a bath. So uh, it was just really maniacal how he was able to control us with music. But I suggested for every parent. Uh, he wrote a lot of the children's songs. Again, you can find that on our website. You can find the recordings of him, everything from burping a baby. It's called Baby Make a Blobble. He wrote a song about that, changing diapers, making bottles, et cetera, et cetera, all the way up to uh, teen life. <laughs> he wrote those songs for us, which makes it so evident that he was paying attention. That's kind of what I wanted to say. To a lot of people, maybe your father played baseball with you in the backyard or did a science project with you. And he wasn't capable of doing that because of Huntington's, but the emotion and the sense that we were observed, watched, listened to, it's all there in his work. We have another question about the book. Um, someone says, thank you. How did you construct the book? So much material, where did you start? Did you have a publisher at the beginning? Can you talk about the process a bit? <laughs> Uh, I, like I said, my, my first selection, uh, the publisher actually approached me and uh, somebody said I should come up with this. And I, I'm laughing because honestly, as I get older, I've dealt with a lot of other people that have written books about my father and I've helped them. We had the Woody Guthrie archives here in New York for 30 years. And I helped researchers, you're interested in this, you're interested in that, et cetera. So a couple of books came out, but I honestly felt that they didn't cover him. They would cover one piece of him, but not the whole. And it wasn't their fault. It's because um, they, didn't, they just didn't have the same vision that I had of the whole person. So from 30 years of working with this material, I knew a little bit about this. I knew about the Jewish stunk. I knew about spirituality, I knew about racism, I knew about fascism, I knew all these different things um, that he had written about. So when they asked me to do this, it was kind of like my top hit, you know, the hit list of things that I would say were the most meaningful to me personally. And I have to stress that I'm not a musician. I do not play a guitar. I wouldn't know a G chord from a C chord. And what I was interesting to me is how this material transcended folk music. So up until then, it was really people who were interested in folk music, or maybe they were interested in Bob Dylan or something like that, that were interested in Woody. And I kind of wanted to say, it's just so much more than that. It's about learning how to live. Because I, who don't know good folk music, I mean, I know folk music, but I don't, you know, I don't play it. I don't go around singing it. Get so much from this material. When he says to you, I say to my woman, dance out to your office, dance up your stairs, dance out to vote, dance out to run things. I just went, that's me. That's what a lot of us are doing. And I felt like as it was really a philosophy. It was a way to learn how to live. It could benefit lots and lots of people, not just folk singers. 
So originally, I collected probably about 800 pieces that I liked. And then they said, uh, the book is only 350 pages. So I had to cut, 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 cut. And again, trying to find one or two pieces in each chapter that would really reflect the whole, which is kind of hard. But I think we did a good job, actually. And I just want to add to everyone who's uh, on right now, like Nora said, we have an exhibit at the Morgan Library um which i will include a link to in the chat and nora has two programs left that the morgan library exhibit closes may 22nd and on may 12th nora will be screening the film 1913 massacre like she mentioned with the documentary filmmakers and having a discussion following then on may 20th nora will be at the Morgan again to do a program called Woody Guthrie's Holy Ground. And that's really talking about the Jewish and Yiddish material that Nora worked with, with the cosmetics and the story of how that came to be. Uh, we will have special guest Lauren Sklamberg of the Klesmatics, who will be playing live music as Nora talks and shares these stories. So there's two more events in person. If you want to attend, I will include a link. Nora, we have just a couple of quick comments um, about, you know, where to get the book. Uh, just everyone, again, you can get it at Scattered Books in Chappaqua. You can get it at the Village Bookstore in Pleasantville. You can get it at WoodyGuthrie.org. You can pretty much find it anywhere. So if there are any other questions. You also said as for Scattered Books and stuff, if anyone wants like a particular, uh, you know, inscription or something like that, I'm around, I'm in town. So scattered right. books can take orders uh, if they don't have any enough in stock right now, and they can take orders. And I can, you know, leave a note and say to my favorite husband, <laughs> love, <laughs> whatever. So, right. yeah, we were trying to do the event in person, obviously, but unable to do it at this time. Normally, we would have, you know, a post event uh, signing. So yeah, just let scattered books know, and Nora's happy to do that as well. Okay. Right. Any other questions? Yeah, uh, well, I see a lot of nice comments. Thank you so much. What a great program. Excellent talk. Um, this was so inspiring. Thank you so much for sharing. I have to leave, but thank you. <laughs> Someone said a match made in heaven, Pete and Woody. Weren't we lucky to have them both? Um, Ronnie said, I remember WNEW. We had some really nice comments up in the front from uh, Walter, who said, I printed Woody's California to the New York Island, I believe for Irwin Silver uh, back in New York City. Yeah. So just a lot of really nice comments that I have here. Well, there's one that really interests me. Yep. I always played your father's songs on my guitar on stage in junior high school, and I love them. <laughs> Hey, this you, did better than, um, you did better than I did. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, um, so I, just want, I was going to ask one, one other question. Nora, can you talk a little bit about the Woody Guthrie archive and where it is and what the status is of this original collection that you had? And right. well, Almost all of this material is at the Woody Guthrie archive. It was in New York. I ran it for about 30 years in New York City. And a few years ago, we were invited to Oklahoma to create the Woody Guthrie Center there in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And we were able to build, custom build our own um, vision of what that center should be. It is a archive, it is a museum, it is an educational center, it is a gallery where new, uh, new uh, exhibits come in that are appropriate. And uh, it's in Tulsa, Oklahoma. It's open to the public. And also just recently, they acquired Bob Dylan's archive. And now the Bob Dylan Center is opening this weekend. And it's side by side with oh. the Woody Guthrie Center, which is so sweet. <laughs> just such a sweet thing. I, I, I met Bob when he first came to New York City in 1961. And it was kind of a funny story. I was watching American Bandstand at the time. I was 11 years old. And he knocked on the door and I was, they were teaching like the Watusi or something on American Bandstand. And I was like, he's like, is Woody go through here? And I just went, no, and closed the door and ran back to American Bandstand. <laughs> anyway, um, 
he's been he's been in our world for a long long time now and just a real sweetheart to my dad very helpful when my dad was in the hospital etc so it's just very meaningful to me to have them side by side now in Tulsa Oklahoma uh, someone said that they just visited the Morgan Library exhibit and loved it. It was truly fascinating. Can you talk a little bit about putting the Morgan Library exhibit together and how it works with the book? The Morgan Library, the book is actually um, an extension of everything that's in the, in the Morgan Library exhibit. And again, we had limited space at the Morgan and you have to be very careful if you have one space for one important thing, what are you going to say? So it was really, I had already done a lot of the work on the book, actually. So I could kind of say, I could look through the book and say, this is important. This is important. If I had to uh, show people, and again, people who come to the Morgan are, are, they're not folk people. You know, you're not, it's not, it's not your audience, it's people. So you want to create something for everyone, which is what we tried to do in the book. And I would say the book is an expansion of what's at the library exhibit. Yeah. And I want to add also about Woody's works is, you know, like, like Nora said, Woody wrote over 3000 lyrics. And so many times we'll see in other books, excerpts of quotes from letters or notebooks, but these, these thoughts and feelings are are really thought well through in his lyrics. So if you want to know what we thinks about a topic, you can find a lyric on it. Nora, would you tell us some of the lyrics that are the most outrageous topics that one might not know Woody Guthrie ever wrote? Maybe we understand the Dust Bowl and we understand unions and the labor movement, but what are some of the wildest lyrics? <laughs> That's a hard one. No, no, well, it's it's May 4th, so may the fourth be with you. I would just say Star Wars Day. Are there any? Yeah, he wrote about uh, spaceships, <laughs> my flying saucer. We did we did that one. Uh, he wrote uh, one of the songs that's in the book is a song about tipping, and it's like ninety nine verses long. I I wanted to put it in the book because it's again it's such a prescient thing that's going on right now about tipping, salaries versus tipping, and Woody's take was let's get good salaries for restaurant workers and for train work, car workers, et cetera. He was actually fighting against tipping in the song. And it was interesting because like all the liberal people are like, give generously, tip, 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 tip. And he was like, no, 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 salary, salary, salary. And uh, you know, there is actually an organization right now, a young woman just started a couple of years ago about uh, fair wages. I don't know if any of you are familiar with it, and I, I wanted to put that song about tipping in the book. It's very unusual. Uh, he wrote about flying saucers. He wrote about baseball. You saw the Joe DiMaggio uh, lyric that's in there. And then he wrote some pretty sexy lyrics that uh, the publisher said, don't put that in the book. Um, we'll have to do the, you know, the Woody sex book at some point, I don't know. But um, not by me. <laughs> you know, I was going to say, uh, uh, years ago, what he was in, a couple of years ago, he was inducted into the Songwriters Hall of Fame. And what I did when I accepted the award is I read lyrics from A to Z. He like a songs, another man sung gone, the you know, Beach Haven ain't my home, California stars, and I just went through A B C D E F G. And the last song was the zoo story. So um, there's, it was fun. I kind of didn't know. I, I said to the songwriters who were there, like, did all you guys write songs from A to Z? <laughs> Woody did. <laughs> of course, they're not all published uh, and they're not all good either. You know, that's the other thing. So. Uh, Nora, we got a question. Can you talk a little bit about what the music was like in your home? Who, uh, besides Woody, did you listen to? What kind of music did you listen to? And what did Woody play in the house? Um, Woody played folk music, but he was also very interested um, in lots of other kinds of music, as was my mother. My mother, again, was a dancer with Martha Graham. She was in the original Appalachian Spring and worked with Aaron Copeland on that. So she was very much uh, in, the, in the art scene in New York City. 
Um, my dad listened to John Cage. I, we have his albums that were in the house, you know. Uh, he listened to blues, a lot of blues. He was very good friends with Lead Belly and Sonny Terry and Brown and McGee. There was always blues in the house. And they were there, Sonny Terry and Brown and McGee were always there. Uh, and uh, we also, we listened to a lot of classical. We listened to a lot of opera. We listened to a lot of Broadway. Uh, my dad actually knew and worked with Harold Arlen. And if you've ever seen, um, uh, what's it? Finian's Rainbow. Finian's Rainbow. Uh, he wrote that part with Woody, the guitar playing guy. Uh, is kind of Woody. It's, it's, his name is Woody in the show. And my dad worked with uh, Broadway writers, et cetera. Um, really just every kind, jazz was always in the house, et cetera. And we went from, you know, Bach in the morning to, <laughs> you know, opera at night, actually. I remember falling asleep. They played the songs of the Auvergne was the songs that you put your kids to sleep with. So I was very, very eclectic. And of course there was rock and roll because when all the folk singers would come, they would come on Sundays, we would have hoot nannies in the house and everybody would sit around tuning guitars, which is torturous <laughs> to hear folk singers tune guitars. Um, so we would all run upstairs and we would be playing the Everly Brothers and learning all the Everly Brothers songs and harmonies and things like that. And my parents were okay with that too. <laughs> Another question, are you, were you or me uh, ever dancers? <laughs> The lineage of dance in the family. Would you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, most of you know my brother veered towards the folk music side, and I veered toward the dance side. And my mother had a dancing school for Brooklyn. Brooklyn people, you might know, my mom had a dancing school on Sheepshead Bay Road in Sheepshead Bay for 35 years. She was the only modern dance teacher in the borough of Brooklyn. And she was the only teacher that was given the right to teach the Graham technique outside of the Graham school itself. And so she had a wonderful dancing school there. Maybe there's someone out there that went there. Um, so I kind of grew up in the dance world. I did become a dancer. I was at the NYU School of the Arts when they first opened. And I was in the first graduating class from the School of the Arts. Now it's Tisch School of the Arts, but when I went there, it was right above Ratner's on 2nd Avenue, St. Mark's Place. And uh, that was our turf then. It was a great school. And then I did have a dance company for a number of years after that. Yeah. And I taught in Scarsdale and did a lot of dance stuff. You know, you kind of retire at 30. At a certain point in dance, like you either quit while you're ahead or you become a dance teacher for life. And I didn't want to become a dance teacher for life. So. I left. I did the Greta Garbo. Leave while you're looking good. <laughs> I will add though that you did choreograph a piece on the Steffi Nassen Dance School, which is located here in Westchester. And we have um, Steffi actually teaches classes in Chappaqua. We have elementary school programs in Chappaqua, right next to Bell School at the church. I was a dancer, and my kids also dance. So four generations of dancers. Nora, a uh, question about family. How many children did Woody have? Would you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, he was married first in Tampa, Texas. Uh, he married very young, he married a teenage sweetheart, and they actually had three children together. Uh, when he came to New York, he met my mom, and they fell in love. And so he got a divorce from his first wife. But we did I, I wrote an article, um, I actually wrote an essay in the book when it comes to family. I introduced the idea of family and how we lived. I knew his first wife and children very well. They stayed with us uh, in our family for many, many years. And then when my father got Huntington's, there was a lot of trouble. Um, he was very, very ill and left the house and remarried another woman it lasted a year. They had a child together. The first three children passed away, two of them from Huntington's disease and the third one in a car accident. And then the youngest one also passed away in an accident. So it's really just me and Arlo and our other brother, Jody, that are still here. 
Well, the essay that you write about all work together as the family motto. Will you talk a little bit about more of a, not specifically your family, but that motto of how to raise children uh, in more of a philosophy? I, I included a lyric and I want to say that I don't include lyrics because I want you all to be singing these songs. I include lyrics because you can read them like poetry, you can read them like prose, you can read them as ideas. So he wrote a song called All Work Together. We all work together with a wiggle and a giggle. We all work together with a giggle and a grin. And he says, my mama tells me something. My teacher tells me something. My daddy tells me something. Grandma tells me something. He goes through the whole family and all the people in the community that he's talking to, they all have something to teach. We all work together. So it starts out with just mommy, daddy, grandparents, uncle, aunts, community, et cetera. It grows and grows and grows. And that's the, the vision that he puts out in this very simple children's song. Uh, I want to say that when you're raised with these words in your head, it's so great. It's just so great. You don't have all these conflicts when you grow up about, you know, black and white to this and that, and oh my God, start parents out there, start young. Teach them all this stuff when they're young, one, two, three years old, start singing these songs. They understand it at that age better than adults do sometimes. And I feel so lucky that all these ideas, now we've, as we go through the program tonight, we've heard a sophisticated version of all work together in this is our country here. But then we heard the same thing in a children's song, all work together in a language that children understand. So he writes at every level for every person, I think. And how incredible it was, I didn't know it until I was older, how incredible it was to learn these ideas early on so that you're not shocked by women's rights. You're not shocked by justice for all. You're not shocked by voters registration. You know what I'm saying? All this is embedded into who, into our souls as children. And uh, I do feel lucky that I had that exposure and those words and ideas in children's words and then in young adult words. And now even in old, old age words. <laughs> Same ideas, you take them through your life. And that's what Dylan said, you're learning how to live. And that's what Woody was all about from infancy till death. Should well, I end on that note? <laughs> I think that's a wonderful note to end on, Nora. Thank you. I'm gonna pass it back to Joan, but thank you so much. Well, I, it, I'm sort of speechless. I don't know what else to say, but uh, I do wanna thank um, both um, Anna and of course her mother Nora for such a fabulous program. The comments just keep pouring in. Everybody is just thrilled with this program. Don't forget we've recorded this program. So if you have any friends that couldn't make it, just go to our website, which is chappaqualibrary.org and look for it on our, uh, and look for it. Just scroll down, you'll see a screen and it'll most likely be right up. It'll take a few days to get up there, but please tell everyone about it. And don't forget, if you're interested in purchasing a book, go to woodyguthrie.org uh, and they'll have all the information or go to your local bookstore, especially Scattered Books, which is the Chappaqua bookstore. She will be able to get it personalized if you're interested. So again, it's just the compliments keep pouring in. I wish I could keep it for you so you could all see it. So thank you all for, see, for coming and um, I'll see Thanks you around. <laughs> Thanks I'll to our community. looking for you now that I know you're in town. So good to now see you, Nora. Thank you. Wonderful, our wonderful community here for hosting this. It is. Oh, and I want to say one other thing. Um, we're going to be having a music uh, series called Out Outdoor Music Series in the summer. And we've got our first um, performer will be um, Fred Gillen, who is a folk singer in the style of Woody Guthrie. And we asked him specifically because he's in the style of Woody Guthrie. And we should have a performers by the Juilliard School of Music also. 
So it's going to be a really good summer program. I'll probably do it at night on Friday evening. So um, well, stay tuned. Go to our website. You know, and that reminds me, Woody Guthrie's American Song is a theatrical production that oh. is put on by communities. And they're auditioning for parts, May 12, 13, and 14. It's in Pleasantville at the Stage Arc. And if you're interested, if you know anyone, it's 18 and up, who would like to audition to be a part of Woody Guthrie's American Song. It is a theatrical production based on his life, including music. You can go to their website and find out more information. Excellent. There's a lot of good information here now. Okay, so thank you all again. Thank you for coming. And we'll see you soon. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.